William Henry Brown is a story shrouded in mystery. From the time he was born to his arrival in Fort Myers, and of course, the exact location of his trading post. But one thing that is not a mystery was to the Seminole tribe, he was a man they would grow to trust, a man of his word. And though many things are unknown, about William Henry Brown. It was that trust that would define him as a man and would create the legend of Brown's trading post. But to understand who William Henry Brown was, we have to first go back to his childhood to the 1850s, the first unsolved mysteries of his life, his date of birth, and his true birth name. My great-grandfather, Bill Brown, came to this country from England. My great-grandfather's name was Goodhind before he changed it to Brown. There's also records that show two different dates of birth. A certified copy of his birth certificate found in his granddaughter Shirley's family collection was for Joseph Goodhind, born December 16th of 1855 in Bristol, England, which differs from his naturalization papers, which read March 17, 1856, born in London. The only information that remains consistent from his childhood was the terrible losses he would suffer in his early years of existence, with both parents falling victim to the plague. William's only escape at the time was daydreaming about Indians and gold and the wondrous adventures of a new land, America. Soon after, William fled his homeland of England by finding work on the Sir Walter Riley ship and enduring over 60 days through the rough Atlantic seas, jumping ship in Cuba, and Joseph Goodhine would change his name to William Henry Brown to cover up his trails, leaving so many details of his young life a mystery. Now, who we know as William Henry Brown, eventually made his way up to Fort Myers and into the lives of the Florida natives. In 1879, he would marry Sarah Jane Jernigan, and by 1885, William Brown was making frequent trips to Big Cypress to trade with the Seminoles to support his family. By now, William Brown was on friendly terms with the natives and fluent with their language. He decided to move closer into Indian territory. The location was the western edge of the Everglades, where heavy canoe traffic increased interaction. By 1901, Brown's trading posts had been established. The boat landing was described as having a storeroom, a barn, a family dwelling, open-sided shed for the ox carts, and an outhouse. So this is the site of Brown's Trading Post marked as the Tippo. It was marked to Copeland in the 40s. We've also undertaken a lot of excavations out here, uh, which include digging shovel tests, which are round holes about a foot and a half by a foot and a half, as well as large scale test units that are about six feet by three feet. Uh, and based on the artifacts that we discovered and everything, you know, we have found most of them in the northern portion of the site, so north of this tree and above by this fence line. Um, but there was so much disturbance that may have been caused due to the construction of the road as well as the construction of a store that came in in the 70s or 80s uh, that we can't place where all the different structures might have been uh, so we don't know where exactly that house was or the where the ox cart was kept um, but we have a basic understanding that the post was probably in this location um, based on all the historic artifacts and the dates that come from them um, and that they're either within here or within about 100 feet, 100 meters of this area. So that's Copeland's marker. He placed with Frank Brown, who's Neil's dad, uh, and they came out and they just based on some barbed wire they found and what the location looked like. Copeland went ahead and placed the marker there. Um, and since then we've you know, place protection around it to make sure it doesn't get knocked off since it is a historical marker. The thing with it, it is kind of movable, so we don't know if it's in the exact place that Copeland and Frank placed it all those years ago. This area that we're sitting in today was in water. Water was everywhere. So in order for them to be able to come up to the trading post, he had to dig a canal deep enough so they could bring their boats up to be able to trade there with them at the post. It enabled the Seminoles to cut two to three days of traveling down to just one day 
And from 1901 to 1908, Bill Brown's trading post processed thousands of dollars worth of gator hides and otter hides monthly and up to $17 million worth of plumes yearly. Egret plumes were known to be worth more than the price of gold at the time. It was a symbol of wealth and extremely popular in women's fashions in places like New York and would give the impression of holding a higher status in society. Taking what he traded with the Indians to Fort Myers, returning with goods like glass beads, sewing machines, cookware, you name it. If they needed it, Bill Brown would deliver. They would trade with the Seminoles, the plumes and pods take them over to Fort Myers. They would bring back material for the uh, ladies here to sew with. They brought in sewing machines, and this was when they first started making the clothing here in this area. The Indians would trade with Grandpa. Well, they drove the boats, I think, right up to the Blanton and crawled in the, into the building where the uh, trading boats were. And they'd pull, go to Everglades and trade uh, Ted Smallwood mm -hmm. and come back and trade with Grandpa here, and he'd take them on to Fort Myers. The plume trade became so big, it caught the attention of activists, and a movement was established to outlaw the plume trade and preserve the bird species who had fallen victim to the fad. A campaign was developed through marketing ads and entertainment to change public perception on putting egret plumes on women's hats. Egrets became so endangered from all the hunting and everything in the early 20th century uh, that it became illegal to hunt them as well as to trade in them, uh, which Bill had you know, originally done. So it's interesting that later on, Frank, his son, um, became part of the Audubon Society and you know, the protector of the birds uh, and just recording the birds you know, all around here. Daddy more or less lived off the land. He, uh -huh. he lived like an Indian, really. Mm -hmm. He eat off the land and lived off the land. And he made enough money of gator hides and coon hides and otter hides to, to, you know, make a living. I read some stories about your grandpa, and he seems like he was quite a character. Uh, I tell you, he was a man of his word. He's a man of his word, okay. That's, that's the reason the Indians got along with him. Yeah. Okay. He was a man of his word. Whatever he told you, you could bank on it. And in 1897, William Brown's daughter, Rose Brown, was only 11 years old when she was asked by Bishop William Crane Gray what the town was called in order to establish a post office. Young Rose Brown phonetically sounded out the seminal meaning for my home, and the town known as Allen's Place would forever be known as the town of Immokalee. The history of the Brown family extends, you know, multiple generations into Florida. Hi Naples, I'm Pam Brown, your neighbor from Immokalee, and I would like to be your next state representative, District 80, Tallahassee. And this trading post specifically, I think, is really important because it's one of it's the only place located to where that a trader came in and actually his main audience to trade with were the Seminoles. Archaeologists at the Atafiki Museum are still in search, working hard, uncovering artifacts, trying to piece together the puzzle of Brown's trading post. We found a couple glass beads, as well as a lot of glass sherds, a lot of glass bottles. A couple of them were whole and able to be placed together. One was a dental alloy bottle with mercury, which could have been used probably by the mission that came here that was a hospital as well. And then there's also a California fig syrup uh, sherd that you know actually had that written out on the sherd. And we also found a lot of bullet fragments a lot of metal fragments that could have come from the structure, a lot of just historic ceramic stonewares as well. My great-grandfather was a pioneer in this area in the 1800s when there was not many people that came to Florida and formed a relationship with the people that were already here is unique. I'm very proud of my heritage for that reason. William Henry Brown was an explorer, an entrepreneur, and a pioneer. But most importantly, he was a father and friend of the tribe, an icon of his time, and a story to be preserved. <laughs>